All right. We're going to get straight into the word this morning. Dr. Kanwa is going to be bringing the word this morning. And I just want to, I know you know her. Kanwa, would you come up here? I know you know Dr. Kanwa. And I just want you to stand right here because I want to give honor where honors due. Church, this, this wonderful woman is a picture of resilience. She's someone I think couldn't be better to bring the word on Pentecost Sunday because she's somebody who I've seen lean into the Holy Ghost, sometimes like, like somebody I've never seen, just all, completely. And I've seen her change completely. Can I say that? When you came here, I remember this shy woman with a huge laugh in this room. And I'm telling you, she leaned into God. God gave her a, a, an instruction. He said, to, to, you can go into that if you want to. But he gave her an instruction, do this. And she just went, yes, and then some. And she's committed it and stuck to it and been faithful. And she's someone who has committed to be our prayer armor bearer through thick and thin. She sends us scriptures like every day, if not at three, four times a week, she's praying, saying things that God's putting on her heart. But I have seen the resilience of this individual. So I know she's got a word for us today on this Pentecost Sunday, but Kanwa, I honor you as a friend, as a sister, and as a woman who knows the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pastor Evie, um, I love you so much, and I'm so glad. Are we not so glad to have Pastor Evie this morning? And then Pastor Joel said he was going to be watching online, so can we do a big shout hello to Pastor Joel? Loud, okay. Um, praise God. Um, I want to also, before I go into the word, I just want to say yesterday we had our all team event, and it was such a blessing i was saying afterwards i was like oh my gosh we are so rich in this house it was such a blessing it was just the word like i mean and it wasn't just like people coming out and just talking it was like scripture and scripture and scripture and scripture and scripture. like andre came up pamela and brother femi dr esther bernard um, who else? Bookie, Rick. It was so powerful. It was so refreshing. And the teams, just the joy in the room, the fellowship, the passion for the work. We are so rich in this house. I'm so, I just want to honor every person who serves in the house. The Bible says, Deborah sang a song in Judges where she said, For the leaders who take the lead, bless the Lord. For the volunteers who offer themselves willingly, bless the lord so can we just bless the lord for the people that serve in this house praise you god for the blessing of the people in this house we give you glory hallelujah hallelujah praise god so um by way of introduction of what we'll be going into today by the grace of god um a few weeks ago pastor joel taught on visions and revelations Visions and revelation of the Lord. And afterwards, I was talking to him about it because I said, I was so grateful for that message because it gave me language and scripture for something I'd been trying to seek God about, but I couldn't, I didn't know how to phrase it in prayer. So as, as the April was coming to an end, I'd suddenly started feeling this, just this hunger and this desire for something. I knew there was something he was trying to stir me towards, but I didn't know how to, what to call it. And I didn't know how to, you know, you need to know how to pray for something. You need to know the scripture you're standing on. And so we I come into church that Sunday, 28th of April and by the time Pastor Joel was done I was like this is it this is the thing this I just knew that that's what it was and Pastor Joel when I was telling him about it he was saying how he believed so strongly that this was a word for us as a corporate body at this time something God wanted us to press into and so I've gone back to that message a couple of times I've gone back at least twice to play it back and just listen again I've gone over my notes multiple multiple times I've been looking at those scriptures again and again just meditating on that because I knew that it was almost like something was drawing me to it when he preached on it I just knew that this was what God wanted for us and so when Pastor Joel then asked me to um 
share the word this morning I decided to just carry on in that and just spend some time just reading and studying and so today we're going to spend a lot of time in Paul's conversion story if you remember that was one of the key scriptures we focused on when Pastor Joel taught on visions and revelations but before we go in let's pray dear Holy Spirit we are so grateful for you and to you for who you are in our lives especially on this day where we celebrate the first time you came and not just filled a room but actually filled lives and so Holy Spirit this morning we yield to you Jesus our Lord and Savior said that when you come you would lead us into all truth Jesus our Lord and Savior described you as the teacher so Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us. We yield to you. We submit our hearts. We open our hearts to listen. Lord, you, you are the Holy Spirit. You're the one who, when Lydia listened to Paul at the riverside that day, the Bible says that you opened her heart to pay attention. So we ask you to do that this morning. Open our hearts to pay attention so that we can receive that thing that you have prepared for us to receive today. We will be taught, we will be transformed, our hearts will be set on fire afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, for those taking notes, and if you're not planning to take notes, I'll encourage you to take notes, because I have a lot of notes here. <laughs> um, and obviously for the benefit of the media team as well. Um, so, if we're doing a title, I... I really went over what to call it because obviously I can't call it visions and revelations so um so I will say see the light and you will understand why I've chosen that as we go on so as a topic we're saying see the light visions and revelations will change your life we saw that in the life of Paul the apostle he would never forget what happened to him on the road to Damascus in fact in the book of Acts that story is recounted three times. Once as just an account and twice as Paul's defense for why he's doing what he's doing. And that is where we're going to deep dive into. But before we go there, I'm going to read where Paul references this encounter in the book of Galatians. So I'm reading from Galatians 1 and I'm starting from verse 11. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Andre. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. It came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard about my former way of life in Judaism. I intensely persecuted God's church and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. Paul says here, no one taught me this thing. It came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation of Jesus Christ and then he revealed Jesus in me amen so we're going to go through all three accounts of Paul's Damascus conversion so we're going to start in Acts 9 and we're going to be making lots of notes I'm going to be when we move on we're going to be doing a lot of cross-referencing and connecting and I'm going to be just making some points along the way and hopefully by the grace of God it will tie it all together so Paul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord he went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way this is what they were called back then they were people of the way 
they didn't become we were not called christians until many years later in the town of antioch and then that name spread so all this while especially in jerusalem they were called people of the way so if he found any men or women who belonged to the way he might bring them as prisoners to jerusalem as he traveled and was nearing damascus a light from heaven i want you to underline that if you are someone that underlines and annotates that is going to become very significant so please underline a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him falling to the ground he heard a voice saying to him saul saul why are you persecuting me who are you lord saul said i am jesus the one you are persecuting he replied but get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do the men who were traveling with him stood speechless hearing the sound but seeing no one this is going to be significant when we move forward saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open he could see nothing so they took him by the hand and led him to Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. So he went on a fast because he knew something significant had happened in his life. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias and the Lord said to him in a vision. Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, to the house of Judas and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. When Pastor Joel was preaching and read up to this part, it, it hit me so much that physically he was blind. But in the place of prayer, he had seen Ananias. He could see Ananias in the spirit, even though he could not see in the natural what was going to happen. In the spirit, in the place of prayer, he had seen Ananias. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name, just in case Jesus wasn't aware. And this man you're sending me to, I just want to bring you up to speed about him. Because I've heard about him. You, you might not know this part. The reason he's in Damascus is to arrest people like me and you're sending me to him. But the Lord said to him, go. For this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Two points I want to bring out there. Number one, when you get a vision and revelation from the Lord, it defies logic. Because logically, Ananias had no business walking into the lion's den, basically. Because that's what it would be. I mean, this man has come to Damascus for the sole purpose of identifying and arresting the people who call on the... And you're saying I should go and say, in the name of Jesus, receive your sight. I mean, that is just me getting arrested. Like, what is that supposed to mean? But Jesus said, Go why because jesus had already gone ahead to make it safe for ananias to go he had already gone ahead he knew that what he was sending ananias to he'd already sorted it ahead of time and ananias didn't realize all that had happened but you see when he accepts that goal ananias gets revelation because in verse 17 ananias went and entered the house he placed his hands on him and said brother saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road, how did he know that? that, that we, we don't know how, he, he's not talked to Saul yet. He walks in, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road, you were traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now we're going to go to the first time Paul gives a first person account of this encounter. And that's in Acts 22. And this is where if you like to annotate and write and scribble in your Bible, you're in good company. Have at it. Have fun. We're going to do some, some cross-referencing now. So Acts 22 is starting from verse 1. And I'll just have a sip while you find it. 
Okay. If you're there, say amen. Very good. Okay. Brothers and and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. He's in Jerusalem giving this defense. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, Paul was standing, giving this defense in front of people he had worked for. In front of people that knew that he had come to them in the past to take letters of authority to arrest these people. Those are these people knew. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring the people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, if you're highlighting, that's going to be significant. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven. So that's exactly the same as chapter 9 verse 3 flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That's exactly 9 verse 4. Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. That's exactly 9 verse 5. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice. Of him who was speaking to me. Now, if we go here into, remember I said it was going to be significant. In 9 verse 7, it says, The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. And here Paul says, They saw the light, but did not understand the voice. Which means that the same light that shone on Paul or Saul, shone on all of them but Saul was the only one that could discern the voice that was speaking which means you can be in the same space with the same light what was the difference then pastor Joel said so he, I mean he said it jokingly but I think it was significant that's but you didn't say Saul was on his way to church when he got the vision <laughs> and he says here yeah, I was zealous for God He was doing this from a genuine, heartfelt passion to defend the God of his ancestors. And so when God spoke to him, he could hear it. And so if your heart is right, you will hear the voice. If your motive is true, this is something I've had to come to. To know that, look, when you're stuck in a decision where there is no chapter 8 verse 2, you know, there is nothing in the Bible to tell you which one to pick. If your heart is right, if your desire is God, you will hear the voice. You will hear the voice. Hallelujah. So, verse 10. What shall I do, Lord? This is the first time now we hear that Paul asked a question, a second question to Jesus. Get up, the Lord said, 9 verse 6, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. That's 9 verse 8. A man named Ananias came to see me, 9 verse 17. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul... That's verse 17 still. Receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Remember, it says that in verse 18. At once, scales fell from his eyes. So like, even if the vision he had received was something he was questioning, the speed at which his sight came back, that was a miracle. Then he said, now this is a little bit extra. The God of our ancestors has chosen you And I love this. I said, I take this for me as well. So if you want to take it, go ahead. The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the words from his mouth. Amen. 
Who wants to take that? Hallelujah. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem, now remember um, from Galatians, we know that he went to Arabia, Damascus, and then back to Jerusalem. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance. So this is another vision. And saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people don't. That I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. This is another one trying to logic with Jesus. Jesus said, get up and go. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. I have an inn here. Jesus said, get up and go, leave this place. He said, no, these are the people I need to be preaching to. Don't you understand? Let me explain, Jesus. The way they will believe is because... <laughs> the way they will believe is because they know me. <laughs> it made more sense to Paul to stay in Jerusalem. The same way it made more sense to Ananias not to go to his house. But the Lord said to me, go. I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Jesus knew they would not receive his testimony. And Jesus also knew that he wasn't called to the Israelites. Jesus did not do all that miraculous vision and revelation for Paul to preach to the Israelites. He wanted him to preach to the Gentiles. Paul says in Galatians the, that the, the, the elders of the church finally recognized that I had received a grace of apostleship to the Gentiles the way Peter had received a grace of apostleship to the Jews. So Paul had to recognize that his calling was not what made sense to him logically. Because he would have thought, I've studied. I was Gamaliel's best student. If you don't know Gamaliel, Gamaliel was one of the most respected men in the synagogues. And he's even referenced in Acts, where he stands up actually when Peter and John are being threatened. Gamaliel is the one that gives them advice to say, we know the story of such and such a body who thought he was somebody and nothing came of it. And we know the story of such and such a body who thought he was somebody and nothing came of it. If this Jesus is nobody, nothing will come of it. But if you keep fighting, you will find yourself fighting against God. That was Gamaliel that spoke. That is the man that trained Saul. And Saul was his star student. So Saul said, I know this, this, uh, what do they call it now? Old Testament. What would they call the Jews calling it? The Torah. I know this Torah back to front, up and down, inside and out. By the time I'm analyzing it to the Israelites, they will believe me. Jesus said, no, that's not what I saved you for. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Vision and revelation does not make sense. But what happens in, anyway, let's move on. Acts 26. This is the final time we hear this Damascus story. And obviously, we're going to still try and cross-reference again. So, I'm starting from verse 12. So now he's standing before a king. Now, if you remember what Jesus said to Ananias in chapter 9, he said, this man is my chosen instrument to go to Gentiles, to kings, and to Israelites. And here he is before King Agrippa. I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances of persecuting the church with authority and a commission from the chief priests. King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, that's in 22.6 as well, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. So this is 9.3.22.6. Shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the gods. I asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. There is always a purpose behind visions and revelations. It is not for goosebumps. And it is definitely not for feeling that you're something. It's not for you to just feel good about yourself and be like, ho, ho, ho. I tell you what I saw, what the Lord showed me. No, there is a purpose behind it. There's an assignment connected. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. 
And I love this part. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He said, I am sending you to them to open their eyes. So what was the first thing Jesus did to him? Struck him blind. For three days and three nights, Paul could not see. So that when he went to the Gentiles, he had a practical understanding of their spiritual state. He, could, he knew what it meant to be blind. To be blind and see only darkness. Jesus said, I am sending you to them to open their eyes. So when he got up, he was blind. To turn them from darkness to light. So when he got up, he could, was in darkness. So that he would be touched with the feeling of their infirmity. Because you see, Paul's actual passion... He says it in, the Rome, to, in his letter to the Romans. His passion was for his people. He said, if I could go to hell forever and it will ensure that all the Jews are saved, I would go to hell forever. That was how passionate he was for his people. He never got up and thought, oh, I must go to the Gentiles. They were abominations. He would have brought up to, to despise them. And so God had to do something in him. To make him feel for them. So that even when he writes his preeminent letter. So he has lots of good letters. Don't get me wrong. But the letter where he makes the strongest case for why Gentiles should be saved is Ephesians. If you want to understand why we are here. Why it came to us. Ephesians is it. He builds a strong case there. And in so, over and over in that book he talks about darkness. How they were stumbling in darkness. Stumbling about. Hallelujah. There is a purpose in everything that Jesus permits in our lives. There is, there is something he's working in us for who he has called us to. So, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He saw a literal light from heaven. And then Jesus said, I've called you to turn the Gentiles from darkness to light. Just the same way with Peter on the boat with Jesus and gets the biggest catch of his life. And he falls down on his knees and says, depart from me, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, don't worry. From now on, you'll be fishing men. He likes to make that connection for us. So that we can see it. We can connect it. Because he knows, he knows we're human. He knows sometimes we need a little bit of help. To understand those visions and revelations. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm going to pick up this about the light from heaven. He mentions it three times. And he mentions that the light shone at noonday. The light shone from heaven. Ephesians 5, before we go there. Ephesians 5, verse 13. is one of the times he references darkness and light. And this is what he's going to, I'm going to use to just go into the next part of what we're looking at. Remember, we're looking at see the light in the context of visions and revelations of the Lord. Not just visions and revelations. Visions and revelations of the Lord. That was what he says in 2 Corinthians 12. But when everything, so 5 verse 13, Ephesians, but when anything is exposed and reproved by the light, it is made visible and clear. And where everything is visible and clear, there is light. Therefore, he says, I love it in the CSV because of what we've been doing again and again, what Jesus kept saying to Paul. Remember what Jesus said to Paul every time he fell on the ground when the light was around him? What did he say? Get up. Every time Jesus said, so Paul fell to the ground and, said, and Jesus said to me, get up. And in the CSB, he says, therefore it is says, get up, sleeper. 
and rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. So the light, I'm going to make a case now to tell you that the light that shone from heaven was Christ. Not just, because remember we're saying visions and revelations of the Lord. The light that shone from heaven was Christ. Okay, let's look at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelations chapter 1. I'm going to start from verse 12. Then I turned, this is John. I turned to see whose was the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw several golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a robe which reached to his feet and with a girdle of gold about his breast. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, as white as snow. And his eyes flashed like a flame of fire. His feet glowed like burnished bronze as it is refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And from his mouth there came forth a sharp two-edged sword. And here it is. And his face was like the sun, shining in full power at midday. That's how the Amplified Classic puts it. What time did Paul see the light? Noon, midday. He says his face was like the sun, shining in full power at midday. Let's get a second witness of Jesus in Ezekiel. This is what they call a Christophany. Times in the Old Testament where you see a revelation of Jesus pre-incarnation. And we're going to Ezekiel 1. And I'm reading from verse 25. And there was a voice. Every time the attention is captured first by the voice. There was a voice above the firmament that was over their heads. When they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. In appearance like a sapphire stone. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man. And from what had the appearance of his waist upwards, I saw a luster as it were glowing metal. And the appearance of fire enclosed round about within it. And from the appearance of his waist downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. And there was a brightness round about him like the appearance of the bowl that is in the cloud on the day of rain so was the appearance of the brightness round about this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the lord and when i saw it i fell upon my face i love that every time ezekiel is trying to describe it he keeps saying it was the appearance of it seemed like it, was, it, it looked like, it was the appearance of, remember in 2 Corinthians, when Paul talks about the visions, he says, I heard things that were not possible, were not permissible for man to say, indescribable things. Like he's trying to, it, it, was, like, it was like bronze with, with fire inside, it looked like a waste, and then it's kind of the fire, you know, he's trying to like, you can't really, I don't have, but it, just imagine fire, and then, and then bronze, and then the fire went down, and then the fire went, like, you can't imagine it, but it's glory. It was glorious enough for him to fall on his face. And why am I saying this is a Christophany? Because in Hebrews, because he says this was the appearance of the glory of God. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, speaking of Christ, the writer to the Hebrew Christian says, he is the sole expression of the glory of God. The soul expression. And in the Amplified Classic, he says he is the light being. The outraying or radiance of the divine. The perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. He says he is the soul expression of the glory. He is the light being. 
2 Corinthians 4, Paul says of him in verse 6. For God who said, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. For God who said, other versions says God who commanded. God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts so as to beam forth the light for the illumination of the knowledge of the majesty and the glory of God as it is manifest in the person and revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Remember in Revelations, John said his face was like the sun at midday. The glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. So when we say visions and revelations, when we go into chapter 12 of this same 2 Corinthians, Paul said in verse 1, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Of the Lord. Why? The psalmist says, in your light, we see light. So all the light you need to see, the only light you need to see is Jesus. We are not saying we want to come to visions and revelations and start trying to find out things, getting intel. We're not trying to get intel on people. We're not trying to get intel on the situation we're going through and trying to figure out the who, the what, the why, the when, the how. All you need to see is Jesus. He is all the light we need. Don't we seek him. John said, when I turned, I, I decided to turn to see the voice that was speaking. And on turning, I saw. On turning, I saw. We need to take our eyes off that person. Off that situation. You know, sometimes you can't get your eyes off it. It's so in your face is so persistent it's so loud it's so it's so attention seeking but on turning i saw because when you see jesus when you see the glory when you see the light then you will have a revelation that is unshakable paul goes on to say in galatians chapter 2 this was one of the scriptures Pastor Joel referenced. Verse 2, he says, I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had been running in vain. Now, this is powerful. Paul has already started off in chapter 1 to say, look, this gospel was not taught to me. I received it by a revelation of Jesus Christ. Even in Corinthians, when he gives instructions about the Lord's Supper, he said, I receive from the Lord what I am telling you. In Amplified, he said, it was given to me directly. Paul is trying to tell even the Corinthian church that, look, this is not, Peter didn't come and tell me what happened that night. Jesus showed me what happened that night. And yet, he went to the leaders in the church to say, just check in. Let me just make sure I'm not running in vain. Let me just make sure I got this right. Remember what Pastor Evie said, do not allow yourself to be isolated. Don't allow yourself to be isolated by trouble. Don't allow yourself to be isolated by vision. I know what Jesus showed me. I know, I know. It's my vision. I have a revelation. <laughs> And then you end up, Paul said, I wanted to make sure I was not running in vain. So I went to those who were recognized as leaders. Good counsel, so important. And he says, but not even Titus, because remember the Galatians had gotten off track here. So this is his referencing Galatians trying to now get circumcised and stuff as ways to be saved. So he said, but not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. 
This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment. Why? He knew what he had received. He knew the revelation he had received. He knew what he had seen. He knew what had happened to him. So when other people showed up and tried to infiltrate and try to suggest other things. He said, we did not submit to them even for a moment. We did not give up even for a moment. So that the truth of the gospel will be preserved for you. What was it he saw? It wasn't a what, it was a who. The light from heaven was Jesus Christ. And when he saw Jesus, he became unstoppable. When he saw Jesus, he started on a journey that defied human logic, but became the most significant journey of all of our lives. So who we want, who we seek, who we need to see is Jesus. John 12, verse 35 to 36. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic. Jesus said to them, You will have the light only a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. Keep on living by it so that darkness may not overtake and overcome you. In John 1 verse 5, it says the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness could not overcome it. But then Jesus says, okay, Jesus, that is the true light. Verse 9 goes on to say, he was the true light that was coming into the world. Jesus says, look, this light, you have to walk in it for the darkness not to overcome you. It's not enough to say the light shines in the darkness. Are you in the light? He who walks about in the dark does not know where he goes. He is drifting. But while you have the light, believe in the light. Have faith in it. Hold to it. Rely on it so that you may become sons of the light and be filled with the light.